fans of history, and welcome. Today we're going to take a look at the Reagan Revolution in the 1980s and the end of the Cold War uh, between the United States and the USSR, and the impact that that will have on the United States as we start to head into a new century, the 21st century. Uh, we get some great stuff from Ronald Reagan. I mean, he's one of the most popular presidents in American history, and with good reason. So let's just get into it. Let's take a look at how um, Reagan is going to dramatically impact American history. So first, uh, there's a lot of uh, a disillusionment in America in the 1970s and uh, going into 1980, the 1980 presidential election. First of all, in the 1970s, we had a lot of different uh, problems that were going on. Like, for instance, the war in Vietnam went miserably. Certainly the defeat in Vietnam um, struck a blow to America because up to that point, we really had not lost wars. I mean, we're back to back uh, two-time defending World War champs. I mean, well, there's no reason to think that uh, a bunch of rice paddy farmers, basically, in Vietnam could have beaten the greatest country on earth in war, but it happened, you know? And so uh, that led to a little thing called the Vietnam Syndrome, where certainly Americans were fearful of getting into a conflict like it. Another thing, too, is we had the energy crisis of the 1970s with OPEC, where we saw that we are definitely dependent upon other nations for trade, for oil, and um, that is going to impact our view of ourselves as well. And then we have politicians themselves that are going to kind of mess things up a little bit here and give us some disillusionment. First of all, after the Watergate scandal with Richard Nixon, uh, Gerald R. Ford is going to come in. Remember, he is the only unelected president in American history because he uh, served for two years after Watergate. And then in the 1974 election, he's not going to win it. So uh, the reason that he didn't was because one of the first things that he did as president was to forgive Richard Nixon, who was facing, would have faced criminal charges. Now the next thing that Gerald R. Ford is going to do that will uh, certainly upset a lot of Vietnam vets is he's going to allow amnesty to any Vietnam uh, protesters that had left the country and gone to Canada during the Vietnam conflict to avoid the draft. And so he's going to say, come on back, we'll welcome you home with open arms. Great thing, but at the same time, oh man, that ticked off a lot of those vets that had gone and served and lost them, their, their friends, maybe themselves to PTSD, you name it. And so he is not going to get elected for several reasons. Those are two big ones. All right, now uh, the peanut farmer from Georgia, the former Baptist minister, Jimmy Carter, is going to come in in 1976, and he's going to serve for one term. He's going to have a lot of problems during his presidency that are going to prevent him from getting reelected. Uh, so we don't have time to go over all of those, but let's just say that he tried really hard with some different peace accords between like Israel and uh, the Palestinians, and he did some great things there. But at the same time, his uh, presidency was was ruined by the economy, absolutely ruined by the economy. It's a little thing called stagflation. Stagflation happened because the gross domestic product of the United States had decreased, meanwhile unemployment increased, and so it didn't bring about a Great Depression, but it just meant that the uh, economy was stagnant. stagnant. Uh, we saw inflation on, on bare necessities like oil. Uh, again, the issue of the energy crisis was coming in. Uh, we saw uh, increases on anything that it required gasoline to bring it there, like milk and bread and you name it, your basic things at the grocery store. And so anytime you're paying double for gas, you're thinking, dang it, Carter, it's your fault. And so what this meant is that Jimmy Carter's already having a hard time getting reelected. But then on top of that, we've got the uh, Iranian hostage cr crisis that's going to take place for over a year, 444 days in 1979, leading into the 1980 uh, election season. Worst timing ever if you're Jimmy Carter, but uh, terrible situation too, I mean, for any president, because um, basically Tehran is going to uh, be the epicenter of a Islamic fundamentalist revolution that's taking place with this man, Ayatollah Khamenei, who is going to take over uh, the Iranian government and they're going to establish basically a theocracy. This fundamentalist movement is very anti-American, and so they're going to start by attacking the American embassy in Tehran. And this uh, popular movement, you'll see them burn American flags. I mean, it's not going to be good for the people inside the embassy. Now, some of those people will escape. Great movie about it, by the way, Argo, about how to try and get those people out of uh, Iran and using the Canadian embassy and some help from the Canadians through a really secret subterfuge to help those people escape was amazing. 52 Americans that were held hostage at this embassy, we need to get them out. And so Carter tried things like negotiation, and that didn't work. And he tried uh, all kinds of different methods using diplomacy. And then finally, he sent in some special forces in what was called Operation Eagle Claw to try and rescue these people, but one of the choppers crashed 
and it was a miserable failure and it ended up just being really embarrassing and all the while Carter's trying to uh, campaign for the presidency so he's got a bad uh, economy he's got a hostage situation that's ruining things it's just not looking good and then in comes Ronald Reagan now the hostages will be released on inauguration day of 1981 Who's being inaugurated? Ronald Reagan, who had just won the election, of course. Now, um, there's a lot of uh, theories, conspiracy theories, if you will, called the October Surprise Conspiracy, which is going to uh, ask the question of why is it that these hostages were released on Inauguration Day? Well, later we're going to have some information in what was called the Iran-Contra Affair to show that Reagan uh, was behind some illegal arms trades with the Iranian government. And we did that in order to free some of our hostages in Iran ran from the embassy. Now, that's pretty controversial, and, and uh, extremely controversial, in fact. And, and one of the reasons it was so controversial was because Ronald Reagan, he was running for president. He was not yet elected. And he had sent uh, George H.W. Bush, his future vice president, to converse with the Iranian government uh, without any presidential authority whatsoever, um, to be able to say that if you guys don't release the hostages until after the election, we'll work with you. So which, by the way, totally unethical and illegal if it's true. So Reagan's got both goods and bads. We're going to look, I mean like any president, he's got goods and bads. We'll, we'll take a look at both here. One of the things that made President Ronald Reagan so amazing was his ability to talk to the common man. His ability to talk to Americans in a way that it goes back to this idea uh, in politics today called the beer and chicken wings uh, theory of the presidency where uh, if you are uh, the kind of president that you want to have beer and chicken wings with, that's good because that means you're common man. Like I could talk to Reagan and want to sit down and talk about his movie career and you know do it over a, a beer and some chicken wings <laughs> yeah that's my kind of president Reagan could talk to the American man uh, the American person and and he certainly appealed to a very broad base of people at this time coming right out of the 60s. I mean, the 60s and the 70s were traumatic years for America, revolutionary years in many ways. Uh, first of all, in the 1950s, he was an, a Hollywood movie actor. He did a lot of westerns, like for instance, The Cattle Queen of Montana. And what ended his movie career was a movie uh, in which he starred with Bobo the Monkey. And he felt that they were just making a joke out of him by having him act alongside a trained monkey. So while it was one of his more popular films at the time, he's thinking, I'm done with this. So he decides to go on to become governor of California. He's going to to serve there in the 1960s and, and be a very popular governor and then of course run for president and so Ronald Reagan really represents that golden age of American history going back to the 1950s with the feeling of you know America again two-time undefeated World War champs. We got reason to be excited about ourselves. Uh, economically strong, uh, a government that is limited and isn't getting involved in everybody else's business. That's a big deal. It's part of what you call neoconservatism, a very limited, smaller government, different from the kind of thing that we saw developing in the, in the New Deal with FDR and then developing to what we have today, a big government. He also is a big fan of the pro-family movement, and this is happening right after the pass, uh, well, within a decade of the passing of uh, Roe v. Wade and the abortion abortion laws that are going to make legalized abortion possible in America. So uh, also going against things like in many ways the black power movement also going against things like the women's movement of the time the women's liberation uh, feminist movement saying that you know women have a place in the home and so this is part of that pro-family movement that's going on as a conservative type of appeal so for instance he said government is not the solution to our problem government is the problem this is going to lead to a little thing called Reaganomics now uh, Reaganomics was a program uh, that we have also called trickle-down economics where Reagan is going to dramatically cut taxes for the wealthy but he's also going to cut taxes for the middle class which was great because this was the biggest tax cut in American history think about what this means though if we're cutting taxes on a dramatic level then what that means is uh, you know Reagan's goal is that means the money is going to be spent in the economy and then you know uh, boost businesses make people want to spend their money on businesses and therefore grow uh, employment rates decrease unemployment well that's all nice um, but at the same time if the government dramatically cuts its income from taxation and still increases its spending which he will then that is going to lead to deficit or debt I mean if you take a look at this Reagan has set the record for the biggest percent of increase in the national debt 
debt um, in, during his presidencies. And so he had a lot of expensive uh, things he was trying to pay for, like Star Wars, which we'll get into here in a minute, a lot of defense spending. But at the same time, what will it do? Well, it'll, uh, it'll change America, certainly, and also change the world, because we'll also have the end of the Cold War from some of this. So let's take a look at his foreign policy now. He's going to bring about a little thing that he calls the Reagan Doctrine. Think the Truman Doctrine, but updated for the 1980s. Same thing. Anywhere democracy needs it, he's going to fly in there with his superhero cape and try and save those democratic states and uh, fix the situation with this Cold War that we have with the USSR. Um, so, easier said than done, because he's also going to have some difficulties in, that will become exposed during his second term of office, right? It's called the Iran-Contra Affair. Now, this is going to get exposed in 1986. He's still a very, very popular president at this time, so it's a good thing he was, because he's able to sustain these types of blows to his prestige, um, but, but at the same time, you know, it's pretty controversial, because first of all, the Iran situation is going to get exposed. Uh, at one time, during the election season of 1980, Reagan had said that we will not negotiate with terrorists. And then in 1986, it's proven that uh, he had done an illegal arms trades with I trade with Iran to pay off uh, the trade for those hostages, but also will do it again later, uh, while at the same time sending in covert operations all over the Middle East to target uh, leaders of these Islamic fundamentalist groups. Uh, another problem that we have at this time is Nicaragua, which is another situation that will be exposed. It deals with the Contras. So in Nicaragua, we had two revolutionary groups. They were in the midst of a civil war, um, so we're going to fight a little proxy war here because the communist state of the USSR was supporting the Sandinistas. And and we, the United States, were supporting the Contras. Both groups, by the way, revolutionary fighters, they're not very nice, they're killing people left and right. Both are into drugs, too. Both drug dealers heavily. And so uh, Reagan is going to support the Contras, who were a bunch of drug runners as well as revolutionaries, because they were opposed to the Sandinistas. That's nice. But at the same time, Congress had specifically told him, no, don't do it. All right, Congress had specifically told him, you are not allowed to support this group in a proxy war because it's expensive and we don't want you to. So he was sending CIA support and all kinds of uh, arms and money and you name it. And the way he was paying for that, covertly, was through the sale of those illegal arms. So while he's trading arms illegally to Iran, he's getting money from that and then funneling that over to the Contras illegally, all the while helping to fund a drug cartel that's going to set themselves up in Nicaragua. And by the way, I'm sure that led to some interesting conversations over the dinner table with Nancy Reagan, his wife, when she was starting the Just Say No to drugs campaign in the 1980s. At the same time, this is all part of his Cold War strategy. Ronald Reagan is trying to combat the Soviet Union, which he calls an evil empire. And what he's trying to do is take them out by really outspending them around the globe in, in, in different proxy wars. If we can't beat them in places like Vietnam, we're going to funnel guns, money, you name it, whatever we need, into proxy wars that are going to help bankrupt the Soviet Union, as well as dramatically increased uh, spending at this time. So one way in which we do that was supporting uh, a bunch of Afghan Afghanistan, Afghanistani freedom fighters called the Mujahideen. All right, now the Mujahideen at one time, uh, Ronald Reagan is going to say that they are like the founding fathers because the Mujahideen were a bunch of Islamic fundamentalists who were fighting uh, to expel the foreign invaders of the Soviet Union. You see, the Soviets had invaded in 1979. They'd been fighting a bitter war um, uh, in Afghanistan, which uh, by the way, Winston Churchill had called Afghanistan the graveyard of empires, and with good reason, too, because the Soviet Union is going bankrupt trying to fight these guys. One of those freedom fighters from Saudi Arabia who was fighting with the Mujahideen and taking American guns, money, and training was none other than Osama bin Laden. Now, could Reagan have predicted that it was going to come to 9-11 from all this? No, of course not. But key thing in the story of America here and how it's leading us on that path. Another thing that Reagan is going to do that will make it so that he can outspend the Soviet Union is in the Strategic Defense Initiative, or SDI, but it was nicknamed Star Wars, because this is, of course, uh, at a time when Star Wars was coming out, and basically it's a uh, $2.5 billion spending package uh, in order to make it so that if the Soviet Union fires an intercontinental intercontinental ballistic missile at the United States, it has to go through space. So we have satellite technology that are going to pinpoint that rocket in space, and then we've got like a bunch of X-band radar systems and early warning radar systems and intercept missiles that are going to shoot up into the sky and blast those nukes before they ever enter the atmosphere, which is awesome. And by the way, 
probably would not have worked. It might have been a tremendous waste of money in terms of effectiveness. But at the same time, who knows? Now, the other issue, of course, that comes from a nuclear explosion in outer space is what you'd call an electromagnetic pulse or an EMP that would wipe out our power grid, uh, anything ba battery powered, uh, like this camera, my computer, uh, you know, uh, medical technology, your car, um, the lights in this building, anything that's electricity or battery powered would be wiped out in seconds. And so, you know, we'd basically go back to a stone age. Now, would we be de all dead in a nuclear apocalypse and would Nazi zombies be walking around? No. But uh, would we see the breakdown of the government as we know it? Yeah. So uh, either way, it's not good. But at the same time, the Soviet Union could not afford this. They could not afford this kind of technology. And what this leads to, and another positive of Reagan here, is that it really does lead to the end of the Cold War. And so the Cold War, this, this almost 50-year time period after World War II in which we see this battle of powers, the battle of the superpowers around the globe, is starting to finally come to its conclusion. Now, the reason for that, uh, of course, Ronald Reagan has a huge role in that, but his counterpart in the Soviet Union, Mikhail Gorbachev, also deserves a tremendous amount of credit. So Mikhail Gorbachev is the birthmark that changed the world, they said, because, I mean, you can see that birthmark from space. It's so beautiful. So Mikhail Gorbachev, he came in in 1985 as the new premier of the Soviet Union. Fun fact, he was the first premier, or dictator, a leader of the Soviet Union. Uh, to be born after World War II. So he's got different ideas. You know, he's coming in with a different set of ideas. And he wants to modernize and help uh, the USSR to do a better job uh, so that they can keep up with the, Soviet, with the Americans. Uh, so the Soviets are not keeping up. He wants to help them keep up. One way to do that is to provide what he calls uh, glasnost in uh, Russian society, which is an openness to society in which freedom of speech is allowed to some extent, but not totally, but a little bit more anyway than we had before. Uh, because he knows we need new ideas if we want to make things great in the USSR again. Also, we need restructuring, or perestroika as he called it, which is political and economic restructuring to make it so that the economy can provide both guns and butter. I mean, we want that three-ply toilet paper. We want that Coca-Cola. We want those Converse. We want the Ramones. We want all of these great things like you who that America has. And we don't in the Soviet Union. It's time to have that. Well, he's trying, but at the same time, this is going to lead to issues in the Soviet Union, which, I mean, the walls start to fall. That whole Iron Curtain that uh, um, Winston Churchill talked about in 1946 is starting to come down in Eastern Europe, and it will happen all in one year, all over the course of about nine months or so in 1989. This is a part of what is uh, what people have nicknamed the Sinatra Doctrine. You see, Mikhail Gorbachev uh, goes out and he says to Eastern Europe, look, I can't afford you anymore, okay? I mean, if you guys want to stay with the Soviet Union, obviously I want that. I want you to be with the Soviet Union, but at the same time, I can't afford to take care of your issues anymore, and I'm certainly not going to invade you, because that's expensive too. We're bankrupt after Afghanistan and stupid Star Wars. Thanks a lot, Reagan. So Mikhail Gorbachev says to him, I'll let you do it your way. Okay, so that's the uh, throwback to music trivia here with Frank Sinatra, who said, I did it my way. So Mikhail Gorbachev is going to say, do it your way. And so at that point, many countries are going to start to say, well, what if we have free elections? So all right, fine, do it your way. Well, what if we bring in just a little bit of capitalism? Just a little bit. He says, well, I don't care. Do it your way. Okay, go for it. And so they start to do that. Now, where is this the most dramatic? We're going to see it happen in all these different countries, like Poland and Hungary and, and Czechoslovakia. But where is it the most dramatic? Germany. So in Germany, we've got a, a, a definite symbol of the Cold War. I mean, in brick and mortar. And that is the, the uh, Berlin Wall. And that is finally going to fall in November of 1989 in this dramatic moment in which people are climbing on the wall for freedom and democracy and beauty. And it's all finally going to happen. But then that doesn't mean all the problems are gone. Okay, let's take a look at where this uh, stuff is headed next. In China, we're going to have this little thing in April of 1989 called the Tiananmen Square Uprising. Uh, it wasn't much of an uprising to start. Really, it was just a bunch of pro-democracy students that did things like built a paper mache statue of the Statue of Liberty, um, you know, in front of Mao Zedong in Tiananmen Square, uh, saying we want to have greater freedom. And that didn't go well because the Chinese government sent in the tanks. And as you can see, the tank man, he and many thousands of others are going to end up getting killed, massacred here. Maybe as many as 3,000 people are going to be killed here. So while one superpower of the Soviet Union is starting to fall and crumble here with the uh, end of the Cold War, we see another one rising even higher with the United States, but then we also see China. It's not like America is the only superpower left, but that does lead to 
a lovely time called the 1990s. So let's take a look at the effect of the Reagan revolution. He, of course, is done in 1989, uh, 88. George H.W. Bush wins the election. And uh, we get into the 1990s, a great decade. Let's just talk about it real quick. In fact, I'm going to give you the 90s in 90 seconds. What a wonderful time. I mean, I remember it well. This is my decade, man. The 1990s, great time in which we had awesome television. We had, uh, I'm not happy about the boy bands, but we had grunge rock. I mean, it was beautiful. The economy was strong. The Titanic was a great film. Saving Private Ryan, a great film. So many cool things happening around the globe. Technology booming, cell phones. Game Boy? I mean, so many cool things. But at the same time, the 1990s shows us that there's a lot of unresolved issues that are going to follow us into the 21st century. First of all, America was, it, they felt for a while like they were the only superpower left. And well, that's great, but at the same time, we're going to become the, the target of a lot of hostility. And now it's just us you know, having the highest standard of living in the world and a lot of people hating that. And certainly we're going to become the target of international terror and domestic terror as the result too. We're also going to have an unresolved war in Iraq in which Saddam Hussein was uh, staging a very expensive war, first against Iran, which we helped support him in that, by the way. And then he's going to go uh, into a war uh, against Kuwait. We're going to end up with Operation Desert Storm. But at the same time, we we do not finish the job, if you will. We do not end Saddam Hussein's regime. He stays in power and, of course, we'll have to go back in again in 2003. So what is it that we can learn from this experience with Ronald Reagan as president and the Reagan Revolution? I think ultimately what we see is that the United States comes out of the Cold War as victorious against the Soviet Union, but the story doesn't stop there. I mean, we've got so many unresolved issues of the 1990s, and the dawn of the 21st century is going to bring a whole new set of problems that the United States will have to try and deal with in a different way.